if you want to get literal, hydrophobic stands for water fearing. And so a lot of times people are taught that hydrophobic molecules are afraid of water, but they're not. It's water that's the one that has the issue. Basically the hydrophobic effect is where if you stick something hydrophobic in water, the hydrophobic things will clump together and be surrounded by the water. But it's not that the hydrophobic things want to clump together. It's that the water wants to exclude them. So the hydrophobic effect is really a water exclusion effect. Um, so let me back up and let's look a clo bit closer. So when we talk about elements, that means like individual carbons, individual hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, all these different things. They're all made up of subatomic particles. So in the center, you have this dense central core where you have positively charged protons, which hang out with neutral neutrons. And then around them, you have this electron cloud. So electrons are little negatively charged things and they're, they're even tinier and they whiz around in these clouds. Um, and then all element or atoms can share pairs of electrons to form covalent bonds. So covalent bonds are the type of bonds that hold molecules together. So like if you had a um, sugar molecule, the sugar molecule is going to be like the individual atoms in the sugar molecule are held together by covalent bonds. Um, but then you can also have non-covalent bonds, which are really more like attractions. So with covalent bonds, you're actually sharing pairs of electrons, but with non-covalent bonds, you're just sharing attractions. And the way that you can have these attractions are either, it is through charge. So opposite charges attract. That's like a fundamental, fundamental concept that's gonna help you so much in biochemistry, is just keeping that in mind. You can get differences in charge if you have an unequal number of electrons. So basically the number of protons defines an element. So carbon is always going to have six protons. Oxygen is always going to have eight. If you have a different number, it's a different element. But the same is not true for electrons. So you can have an imbalance of electrons and then you get a full charge. But you can also have partial charges in the molecule that cancel each other out. So basically when atoms share pairs of electrons to form those covalent bonds we're talking about, sometimes they don't fair, share fairly. Um, and when this happens where you have an unfair sharing, so one of the sharers is hogging the electrons, we call such hoggers electronegative, um, then you get what's called polarity, where you have the separation of partial charges within a, um, a molecule that might be neutral overall. And a key example of this, like one of the best examples, and that's fundamental in biochemistry, is water. So oxygen is one of those electrons hogs, those electronegative elements. So when it shares electrons with hydrogen, it's going to pull those electrons towards it, and that's going to make it partially negative, which we can which we draw with this like delta negative sign. So that weird little like curvy thing that looks kind of like a Hershey kiss, that's a del lowercase delta sign. And so this is saying that the oxygens are partially negative. The hydrogens, on the other hand, they're having those electrons stolen, so they're going to be partly positive. And so with, when we think about this, so remember you have that electron cloud. So when we say that like a region is... Um, partially positive or whatever. Think of that electron, like the electron cloud density shifting more towards the oxygen. So electrons, remember they're whizzing all around. So it's more like, you're more likely to find them by the oxygen than by the hydrogen um, because oxygen is more electronegative. And since you have this uneven distribution of charge, now you have and you have like this whole sea of water molecules, the negatively charged parts are gonna be attracted to the positively par charged parts of other water molecules. And so you can get these like strong water networks, but these are non-covalent bonds. So they can break apart and come together and break apart and come together. So you're able to have like this fluid water situation. 
Um, but all the waters are really happy because they're hanging out with other water molecules and you have this um, polar distribution where you have the positive parts get to hang out with the negative parts um, and vice versa. And um, so when water does this, it actually is um, doing this through hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bond is just a special name we give for a non-covalent interaction when it's between a lone pair of electrons, so like those little dots things on the oxygen um, and a hydrogen that's attached to something electronegative. So water molecules can form these hydrogen bonds, um, which again is just a fancy name for a non-covalent bond between something that's electronegative and something uh, with a lone pair and then a hydrogen attached to something electronegative. Um, so yeah, so the polarity of water makes it want to water molecules want to hang out with each other. Um, so if you stick something in water, it's only going to want to, um, it's only going to like let it into its water network if that thing has something to offer the water. So we call um, such like molecules that water likes hydrophilic. Um, so water loving or water loved. Um, and so basically these things could be other highly polar molecules or um, fully charged molecules like um, salt ions. And so an ion is just a name that we give for something when it has a full charge. Um, and so that sort of thing can dissolve in water and it, um, and all of that. But what if you um, stick something hydrophobic in? So a hydrophobic things are basically um, non-polar things. So you get such molecules with um, like hydrocarbons. So hydrogen and carbon are um, fairly similar when it comes to their electronegativity. So you're not gonna have like um, this charge difference if you have a hydrocarbon. Um, and so when you put such a thing into the water, the water's not gonna wanna hang out with it. Um, and so the water is going to want to minimize the contact that it has to make with this hydrophobic thing. And so what you kind of get is the water like cinching around that thing. Like if you think about surface tension, how like sticky water molecules are for one another. So here's like the same sort of thing except you're sticking like, you're sticking around this other, this thing that you have to, um, that is, there, but you don't want to come into contact with it. You want to come into contact with other water molecules instead. So if you kind of like the water molecules cinch around that thing, um, and make that happen. And so it's actually, it's like an entropy driven process. Um, so entropy is, um, this basically a fancy term for randomness or like, um, disorder. So basically molecules like to be all loosey goosey and all free. Um, the more possible like states or conformations that they can be in, the happier they are. Um, so this is one of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so if you have, so say you have two um, nonpolar molecules in water. If the water molecule, so water molecules surround um, the things that are dissolved in what are called clathrates, which are like shells of water. So if you have these two separate nonpolar molecules, you're going to have to have a clathrate around both of them. So you're taking a lot of water out of commission in order to surround these molecules. But if you clump those um, molecules together, those um, nonpolar molecules together, now it takes fewer waters to surround them and you're freeing more waters. Um, to be free to um, play around with the other waters, because um, remember, with the um, with your water networks, they um, the bonds are they're not permanent bonds; they're just covalent bonds, so they can like come and go and um, come and go. But they're more like locked in place when they have to be like surrounding something in this clathrate. But in the general like bulk water, they're more free. Um, so even though you have to like break up some bonds to or some of these like um break up those shells in order to combine the nonpolar things you're still getting this increase in entropy from um freeing those waters which makes it worth it um and so the non 
um, the hydrophobic effect is actually like a main driving force for protein folding. Um, different pro different amino acids have um, different amounts of hydrophobicity. So the hydrophobic effect kind of forces those hydrophobic amino acids in towards the center of the protein. Um, so that's why you're more likely to find them there. And it's like this, it serves, serves as this driving force for protein folding. Um, so a lot of times people think about like charged residues and that sort of thing, but it's actually this hydrophobic effect that has um, this huge impact. Um, you can also have amphiphilic molecules, which are partly hydrophilic and partly hydrophobic. Um, and so a key example of this would be like um, soaps and detergents um, and phospholipids, which are what make up our membranes. So they have these um, hydrophilic heads and these hydrophobic tails, and um, they arrange themselves so that the hydrophobic, um, the hydrophilic parts are facing the water and the hydrophobic parts are clumped together. So it's the same sort of thing we saw before, except um, here we can form like membranes and bubbly type things called mycels. Um, so yeah, so remember when um, not to blame the hydrophobes, blame the water. Um, so yeah, hope that helps.